Proudly, we hail. City, where the American stage begins, here is another program with a cast of outstanding players. Public service time has been made available by this station for your Army and your Air Force to bring you this story, as proudly we hail the United States Army. Our story is entitled, Birthday Salute for Fort Riley. This is the story of the colorful and exciting 100-year history of Fort Riley, Kansas. Once a frontier outpost guarding settlers from Indian attack. Now one of the most important army training centers in the nation. Our first act curtain will rise in just a moment. But first, here's an important message that concerns all the young men and young women of America. If you know radios, telephones, motors, or if you're experienced in any other technical skills, you are needed in the United States Army. Your expert knowledge and know-how is just as essential to the Army as is the man with the gun. You'll be an important member of the team. For the high school graduate thinking about a future career, this is a must. You can begin immediately training for a highly skilled position and a vigorous, active life. Visit your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station. They'll help you to decide where you're needed most. You'll be proud of your part in assuring the future security of our country. If you're interested in more information, see your Army recruiter today. And now, your Army and your Air Force present the proudly we hail production, Birthday Salute for Fort Riley. The letter from the White House was not long, but it pretty well summed up the meaning of the occasion. It was addressed to Major General Thomas L. Harrell, Commanding General Fort Riley, Kansas, in commemoration of that military establishment's 100th birthday. Dear General Harold, for a hundred years, Fort Riley has been part of the color and spirit of the United States Army. Something of the frontiersmen, of the blue-clad cavalrymen, has come down through the years and helped to inspire the men in khaki who subdued our enemies in great world wars. That quality, a persisting to this day, is one of those factors that make the American soldier of today a formidable defender of freedom. A sincerely, Dwight D. Eisenhower. Something of the frontiersmen, of the blue-clad cavalrymen. To begin, we must go back to the year 1842 and come at eventide upon a small encampment where men are busy picketing their horses under a flaming sky and the great rolling land seems to reach out forever. Easy there. Easy. Oh. Well, we can rest easy, Captain. No sign at all, Kit? Some. But it's nine, ten days old. Whole caboodle heading down the smoke. Good. You know, Kit, this land never ceases to amaze me. Like a great sea. You wonder if it'll ever end. Yeah. <laughs> Plenty of room. That's what a man needs, Captain. Maybe one day it'll be filled up. Oh, I allow folks will come this way. We just can't stop them. You know, as a soldier, I can't help but look at terrain in terms of its possible use as a military sense. Yeah, been times when I had to do that right quick. Here we are, right at the junction of the Smoke and the Republican Rivers. Trail going west, bound to pass close by here. And the rivers are usable. Right. You know my name isn't Charles Fremont if this isn't an excellent spot for a fort. From Leavenworth to this point here. If the Indians were hostile, cavalry could protect the whole area. Well, Captain, I agree. It's a mighty handy spot for a fort. And let settlers start pouring over this land and you're going to need it. So it was that the soldier explorer, Captain Charles Fremont, on his expedition to the Rocky Mountains, guided by the noted scout and trapper Kit Carson, 
encamped at the junction of the Smoke and Republican Rivers in the territory of Kansas. His observations there he remembered and passed on to his colleagues, one of whom was Major E.A. Ogden, stationed in 1852 at Fort Leavenworth. Don't just stand there grinning. What's the word? The word is, my beamish boy, that Major E.A. Ogden has been appointed to take out a scouting party and find a building site for a new fort. Wonderful. When do we leave? I don't recall saying I was going to take you along. Well, you might not recall saying it, but you are going to, aren't you? Now, see here, Captain Cowan. Are you given to ordering superior officers? Oh, not at all, my good Major, but I, I sure want to volunteer. Mm. And if you do go, I'm sure every Arapaho, Pawnee, and Sioux will spot that red top of yours and we'll all lose our scalps. Well, then we can ride to glory together. When do we leave? How big a party are you taking? Move out at dawn. I'm taking a second, sir. <laughs> How much farther is this place that Fremont told you about? It's not far. It's where the smoke joins the Republican. Oh? You seen the site before? Once. Fremont knew what he was talking about, huh? That Charlie usually does. I. Troop! Halt! Troop! Sweet sir. You know, I guess you were right. Looks like every Arapaho is soon. They're Dakotas. A war party? From the looks of them. Too far south of their own territory to be anything else. Must be 500 of them. At least. It was like they came right up out of the earth. Easy, easy, girl, easy. Yes, they're, they're good at that. You'd think they'd attack. We could be the vanguard Look, of... they're starting to move. True. They're, they're turning off and going out of the river. We can all thank God for that. True. Point. Halt. Upon his return to Fort Leavenworth, Major Ogden reported the site of the junction of the Smoke and Republican Rivers an excellent one to erect a fort. And a year later, with the Major in command, construction was begun. Native cottonwood, pine, hedge, and oak were used for lumber. Limestone was quarried from the surrounding hills, while hard-to-get supplies were shipped down the river by flatboat. And ever and always, throughout the fort's building, the men worked under the threat of Indian attack. What's the date today? Hmm? Date? Well, it's 14... June 27, 1853. June? It's almost the middle of July. Not for us, it isn't. Dispatch just came in from the Adjutant General's office in Washington. It's dated June 27th. It's a date we won't want to forget here. Why? What's so important about it? The fort's been given a name. But it's got a name, a good name, Fort Center. Geographic center of the country. And Now so it's... it's been changed to a better name. Under General Order 17 and in honor of Major General Bennett Riley... We're henceforth to be known as Fort Riley. What do you know? Fort Riley, huh? Fort Riley. Not a bad name at all. A good name from a good man. During the next two years, Fort Riley grew by leaps and bounds. Construction crews were enlarged to include civilians. Wagon trains stopped for water and supplies, and cavalry patrols gave them protection along the trail. With the summer of 1855, frontier warfare with the tribes became particularly heated, and the main complement of the fort rode out to take part in the campaign against them. Major Ogden, left with only a few companies of the 6th Infantry, faced the summer heat and the growing tide of settlers with considerable concern. Sergeant Lowe! Yes, sir? Have that wagon train leader come in here. Yes, sir. Horton, how many trains have you led west? I ain't rightly counted. Why? Because any greenhorn tenderfoot would know enough to boil all drinking water en route. Look, Major, you boil all the water you want to in this here fort, but you ain't got nothing to say about what I do with Horton, the way I... you put in here for supplies, and you're getting them. But while you're here, you'll do as I say. You know what a cholera epidemic can do? Ah, uh, cholera, I been... I don't care what you've been. Cholera hits your train of this fort. It can wipe out every man jack of us. Now, Sergeant Law, you take a squad of men and see that all the drinking water on the Horton wagon train is boiled. Now, see here, Major. Either that I... or the train will be out of here before sundown. Why, you... Now, see you... to it, Sergeant. Yes, sir. <laughs> Uh, oh, hi, Joe. <laughs> All you army fellas have to move like the devil was driving you? <laughs> well, now, Joe, 
Since you engineer critters are so slow about your work, somebody's got to move fast. <laughs> yeah, what's your problem? Yeah, get Horton straightened out. Yeah, pig-headed cuss. Yeah, they moved him out this morning. Yeah, Major's really worried about Collar. Yeah, taking every precaution we can. What are you going to do with it, people like Horton? Yeah, I've tried to hammer it into my crew, but I can't be sure all of them obey the rule. Yeah. We get through August, we'll be all right. All right, Joe, Major wants you on a double. Yeah, I'll see you, Joe. Sergeant, have assembly sounded. I want every man on duty or off at the South Parade at once. Cholera has broken out amongst the civilian population. Cholera. Despite all precautions, the dread disease struck and swept like a raging prairie fire through soldiers and civilians alike. It respected neither rank, sex, nor age. Major E.A. Ogden, commanding officer, Mrs. Armistead, whose husband later became a well-known Confederate general, the new captain from the east, and the corporal's children, all were victims. And daily the list of dead grew. And with no officers left to take charge, panic struck the civilian population and flared into an ugly, maddened mob. Hey, Joe. Joe, do you have any men you can depend on? About a dozen. All right, get them here quick as you can. You men stand your ground there. Get out of our way, Sergeant. We're coming through. You come any closer and we'll be forced to fire. And no one leaves this fort until the sickness is over. Yes, Paul. I say so. These men with me say so. And if necessary, our guns will say so. You ain't in command here. Yeah, well, I'll take in command. Now go on home. And you can't hold us here. So, nurse, hold your fire. Now listen to me. Listen. You want to go out of here and go back to Leavenworth, maybe start an epidemic there? We don't want to stay in here and die. And that's what we'll all do if we don't get out of here. Yeah, we're all in this together. I've got 15 good men, Perk. Yeah, looks like we're going to need them. Yeah, get them up along the wall. Yeah, let me talk a minute. Quiet! Quiet a minute! Quiet! Now, you all know me. I'm Joe Sawyer. And what the sergeant says is right. We're stuck with this thing. We can't go off running like scared rabbits and pass it on to other folks. You, Doak Henderson... I thought you were a man. Who says I ain't? And you, Riley, you Connors, yeah. acting like a bunch of scared women. Yeah. Now, I aim to stay here with the sergeant and his men. And I've got 15 lads all armed and ready to help out. Yeah. Now, let's not add bloodshed to the pack of trouble we already got. There ain't no officers left, and the sergeant knows his business. He's in command, and what he says goes. Now, let's stick together in this thing, men. It's the only way we can lick... All right, now. All right. First thing we got to do is organize burial parties. The second is to isolate all known cases and those that look suspicious. Now, if we keep our heads and work together, we can lick this one. You are listening to the Proudly We Hail production, Birthday Salute for Fort Riley. We'll return in just a moment for the second act. Young man, if you want to be the sort of man that others look up to, you'll get there fast if you can qualify to join the Army. You'll see it change from the very moment you put on the uniform of a United States soldier. You'll not only stand straighter and taller, you'll walk with the sure tread of a man who knows where he's going. Your training in the Army will give you the confidence of a man with an important job to do. You have to pass the mental and physical examinations in order to get in this oldest military service in our country. But once you're in, you're on the way up. Visit your local United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station. There's a recruiter there who'll be very glad to tell you all about what's in it for you when you join the United States Army. You are listening to Proudly We Hail, and now we present the second act of Birthday Salute for Fort Riley. Before a determined sergeant named Percival Lowe, with the help of a civilian engineer named Joseph Sawyer, did lick the terrible epidemic, approximately 100 men, women, and children had perished. But through the efforts of these two men, a serious panic, which could have led only to greater disaster, was averted. For the next few years, Fort Riley continued to grow and play a leading role in the opening up of the territory and the protection of wagon trains west. And then came that fateful day, April 12th. 
It's war! Well, boys, I got to be on my way. Whichever side this ruckus Virginia's on, that's the side you find me on. Well, Clem, you wanted to be a cavalry man. Looks like you're going to get plenty of chance. Looks like we all are. For four bloody long years, the war between the states went on. And in that time, all work on the fort ceased. Undermanned and caught in the vicious guerrilla border warfare that took place in Kansas, its small cavalry patrols did what they could to protect the settlers against renegade bands and men like Quantrell, who treated all as combatants and showed no mercy to anyone. Sergeant, take two men. See if there are any survivors. Too late, always too late. If I ever catch up with that murder and Save devil. it, Alan. But this ain't war, Todd. It's a... I know, I know. Sergeant, all right. Two, four, two. <laughs> You're sure the man can be trusted, Captain? His home was in Lawrenceville, Major. He was away when Quantrill struck. He lost his wife and three children. I see. And uh, he's sure that Quantrill is hiding in Locust Valley. Been on his trail for over two years. Just about as long as you have, Captain, huh? Just about, Major. August 63. All right, Captain. Take whatever men you need. Go get him. Thank you, sir. We have you surrounded. Either throw down your arms and come out or we'll open fire. All right, men. Open fire. Eighteen sixty one, eighteen sixty five. And then it was over, and peace had come. And once again, men looked to the west and wagon trains began to roll. But now they were accompanied by a faster, newer mode of travel, the railroad. It, too, was moving west. And in its twin ribbons of steel, slicing across the land toward the horizon, the Plains tribe saw in it their doom. Cradle of the Cavalry, so Fort Riley came to be known, for it was here that the nation's most famous cavalry regiments were formed, and in 1866, the most famous of all came into being, the 7th. Commanding Officer, Colonel A.J. Smith. Second in command, Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer. Let me ride out with the 7th and the 2nd Infantry in support, and I'll put an end to your Indian wars quick enough. George... If confidence and enthusiasm alone could solve this problem, I'm sure you could do the job with no more than a troop at your disposal. But this is a far different kind of fighting than you're used to. More good men have lost their scalps out here because they underestimated the great courage and ability of their adversaries. I admire their courage and their ability, Colonel, but I admire my own more. <laughs> I like you, George, because you're so modest. Well, I can't <laughs> help what I know. And I know, given the men, I can put an end to this affair. Let me tell you something, my eager young bucko. If there's a better cavalryman in all this territory than a Cheyenne warrior, it'd be a Sioux brave. I know, Colonel, I know, but if you... You just... don't know, George. That's what I'm trying to tell you. That's why I want you to ride out with Captain Todd's troop. Todd's been here since he was wounded at Gettysburg. He's a good man, and he knows his business. I'm sending Carr the scout along. I've told him to take you right in amongst the Sioux. So I've come to being a schoolboy again. Try not to act like one, George. Joke all you like, Colonel, but one day I'm... Ah, youth, youth. One day, someday. That's not today. Today you learn. Orderly, show Captain Todd in. Lodges run along the riverbank for more than two miles. How many braves did you say? Over a thousand. And from the sounds of it, getting more riled up every minute. Can we get any closer, Carr? Not unless you want to join in their dance, Colonel. They're Ogala Sioux? Mm hmm. And when they're riled up like this, <laughs> they just ain't nothing to fool with. I wish that moon would stay out. Tell me, what'd prevent us surrounding them and coming in on them from both ends of the valley? <laughs> the 
Can't be very sharp eyes. We got through. Three or four men may be able to sneak in on them, Colonel, but not a half a dozen troops of cavalry. Uh, a hundred good men, and I could break a lot of them. <laughs> you may change that figure somewhat, Colonel. After you fight them a bit. <laughs> Take your troop and flank them from left. I'll attack from the center. Spielberg, pound the charge. Well, George? Uh, we had them, or so it seemed. They got away. Change your opinion? They're smart. They ride like demons and fight like devils. <laughs> now you're learning. But I'm the one man who's going to tame them. It took three years of taming before the tribes, hurt but not defeated, retreated from the territory to carry on their fight further west. Custer and the 7th, along with other cavalry and infantry regiments, pursued them. The story of their campaigns and the fate of Custer at Little Bighorn in 1876 are well known. But they do not have a part in the story of Fort Riley. For even though cavalry was still the mainstay of the post, and small mounted units escorted settlers safely back to their homes in northwestern Kansas after their annual spring trek for supplies, the days of Indian warfare were all but over. <laughs> In 87, a school of light artillery is added to the fort. December 1890, troops of the 7th and 9th Cavalry and 2nd Infantry take part in the battle against Bigfoot and his warriors at Wounded Knee Creek in South Dakota, ending all Sioux resistance. And so the years roll on, for the most part in a long period of routine soldiers. Occasional Mexican border flare-ups send units of troopers from Fort Riley maneuvering southward. But for a period of nearly 30 years, the cradle of the cavalry is rocked gently in the calm waters of peace. And then, 1917. Gentlemen, we're going to have our hands full. Fort Riley will not only be our key cavalry training center, but it's also going to be one of the largest infantry training centers in the country. Need I mention that we all have our work cut out for us? Camp Funston, they called it, the infantry training center of Fort Riley. Into its building went 47 billion, 700 million board feet of lumber, not to mention thousands of carloads of hardware, roofing, and plumbing supplies. It covered an area two miles long and could accommodate over 50,000 men at one time. It became the largest army post of semi-permanent type built in the nation in World War I. Two short decades were to separate the ending of the First World War and our entry into the second. In the latter half of that second decade, Fort Riley began to swell the ranks of the U.S. Cavalry, which had now become largely mechanized. A rigid expansion schedule was set up for the construction of new buildings and new camps. A new building sprang up every 47 minutes, and training went on at full speed. Tanks now, instead of horses, fast-moving infantry learning new techniques and methods soon to be put to the bitter test. Hey, what's the date today, Buzz? Well, according to my calendar, it's uh, December 7th, 1941. But more important, it's Sunday. And Sunday means a day off. Yeah. So get out of that sack and let's go to town. Sunday. Nicest day of the year. <laughs> Sunday, the nicest day of the year, and the country was once again at war. Again, Fort Riley became one of the most important training centers for both cavalry and infantry in the nation, and various divisions and regiments wrote their history in the Hall of Fame after their training at Fort Riley. 26th Cavalry Regiment, wiped out on Bataan, April 1942. <laughs> Second Cavalry Division, 9th Armored Division, 124th Cavalry Regiment, the 11th, 21st, and 36th Corps Headquarters, the 10th Mountain Division. All played their vital part in the winning of the war. 
Today, in this perilous time of communist threat, 100 years since its founding, Fort Riley continues to hold a position of great importance in the military training and defense of our country. Fort Riley's not only the home of the 10th Infantry Division, but also the Army General School. It's the latter that you're concerned with. You men have been assigned to the part of the school known as the Department of Tactical Research and New Doctrine. <laughs> what that means in your case is that you become members of the aggressor force, which acts as the mythical enemy of the country during maneuvers. Eighteen fifty three, nineteen fifty three. From a frontier outpost to a major training center, such has been the colorful one hundred year history of Fort Riley. And the men who serve there who help to write the pages of our history with their deeds, the list is long and noteworthy. Fremont, Kit Carson, Ogden, Custer, Jeb Stewart, Leonard Wood, Pershing, Merrill, Wainwright, MacArthur, Patton. The names are many and impressive. The role is long. The service to country immeasurable in time and courage and sacrifice. And so, proudly we hail Fort Riley, Kansas. America's finest men re-enlist in the United States Army. Take advantage now of the U.S. Army's career guidance program that gives you planned advancement. Men with prior army service may now enlist directly for the infantry, field artillery, armor, corps of engineers, or the anti-aircraft artillery. You can go up fast in one of these crack action teams. You'll get well-planned schooling to speed you on your way, and promotions will depend on your skill and all-around efficiency. Moreover, if you've been out less than two years, you may be eligible to re-enlist in an attractive grade. Check with your United States Army and United States Air Force recruiter for full career details. He'll advise you on the many personal and financial benefits of service when you re-enlist in any branch of our modern army. Remember, if you're a veteran of the United States Army, you can choose your branch of service when you re-enlist. This has been another program on Proudly We Hail, presented transcribed in cooperation with this station. Proudly We Hail is produced by the Recruiting Publicity Center for the United States Army and United States Air Force Recruiting Service. This is Kenneth Banghart speaking and inviting you to tune in the same station next week for another interesting story on Proudly We Hail. <laughs>